all of you. My name is Brent Stevens. I'm the superintendent of Berkeley Unified School District. Um, welcome to every single one of you who have joined in. I see we have uh, over 200 participants uh, at this point in the evening. Um, uh, tonight, we plan a sort of two-part engagement. Um, first hour from six to seven uh, will be the annual State of the District meeting uh, hosted by the superintendent. Uh, this is the traditional launch of our budget and planning season here in Berkeley. We're accustomed to doing these meetings uh, in person. That will take place between six and seven. Uh, we've extended this evening's meeting from seven to eight. Uh, to have an unscripted sort of panel dialogue with a number of parents uh, who will be invited to join us as pa uh, panelists. Uh, that will be specifically about school reopening. Uh, if that's the portion of the conversation that most interests you, you're very welcome to uh, rejoin us at seven o'clock. Uh, and of course, everybody is welcome to stay on for the full two hour session tonight. So the, again, the first part of tonight's presentation will be a, um, a mostly presentation description of the state of the district. Second part of the evening will be an unscripted dialogue with parents uh, on many topics related to school reopening. So with that, let's jump in. Um, first, welcome to all of you. Um, I know that we'll have folks, um, parents, guardians, and caregivers from all over our district. So if you're coming from any one of our preschools, our elementary schools, middle, high school, or adult school, uh, if you're a community member or school district staff joining this evening, really glad that you're here. Um, we appreciate your participation tonight. Uh, this evening, uh, during the state of the district component of the night, uh, we'll be sharing lots of information, but we imagine that there will be time uh, to dip into some of the Q&A that is being written in. I see that we have our first entry now. So if there are particular questions along the way that you'd like to see answered, you're very welcome to drop a note into the Q&A section of the Zoom screen. Uh, and we may have some time for some live interaction during the district, a state of the district presentation. During the second hour from seven to eight, um, we will much more heavily feature the um, questions and live questions from our participants. I uh, do want to acknowledge that this is a state of the district meeting unlike any before it. Um, we are um, now still in the middle of what has been just a remarkable year um, with many notable milestones and some incredible challenges that have faced our community, our school district, our country, our globe. Um, these are some images, uh, many of which very recent. Um, and uh, from here in Berkeley, um, representative of the passion, the concerns, the challenges that we're all facing right now. Dr. Stevens, yes. I don't interrupt you, but um, did you still want me to introduce you now that you've already uh, in one moment? Oh, okay. I didn't right, know that. I've got a section for you. Yeah. Okay. Told you. <laughs> And then um, I just want to, uh, again, just, just in case uh, you've just logged in, uh, we're planning a two-part um, uh, sort of meeting this evening. The first part is the historical state of the district address by the superintendent. Uh, the second part of the meeting from seven to eight o'clock uh, will be an unscripted dialogue with a number of parents who will join us as panelists. And that um, conversation um, will go on from seven to eight and we'll focus exclusively on the topic of school reopening. Uh, and in that particular section, we're going to invite live questions and really hope that that will be an opportunity for some unvarnished and candid conversation about all things related to uh, school reopening. Uh, we're using the same Zoom link for both of these meetings. So if you do want to log out and then log back in, you're very welcome. Or if you wanna pass along the Zoom link to another uh, family who might join in, then please do that. Uh, the ground that we intend to cover, um, first we'll talk a little bit about accomplishments during the fall of 2020. Um, there have been a number of them. There have been lots of folks working very hard over the course of this distance learning period. And so it is important, despite the challenges, despite the emotions of this moment, um, to acknowledge some of the accomplishments of our colleagues and our schools during this period. I'll touch during this first hour only very briefly on school reopening to return to that topic between seven and eight. We'll talk a bit about um, state funding for the 21-22 school year, give you all a sense of uh, what the budget is looking like, and then talk um, about four specific community engagement efforts taking place this spring, in addition to all of our work on reopening our schools. That includes the development of a brand new local control and accountability plan, uh, English learner master plan, a middle school student assignment engagement process, and the development of an African-American success framework. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to the president of our school board, Ty Alper, and, and he'd like to offer a few words of welcome. Ty. Thanks, Dr. Stevens. Um, 
and I'm not going to say very much uh, except to welcome everybody. We there's almost 350 people here. One advantage of Zoom, I think, is that it's easier for people to log on from home, which um, which is it, which is which is a nice side benefit um, that so many people have taken the time out of their evenings to join us and to hear Dr. Stevens' presentation. Um, I think. It's obvious that the, the fact that our schools are closed is probably the, the thing that's on everybody's mind the most, but um, there's a lot of things going on in the district um, that are inspiring and exciting and that are very challenging and, and um, raise concerns. And that's what the state of the district means. And, um, and it's important that as many people in the community are here to hear um, from our superintendent about what's going on in the district. And then I really want to appreciate um, Dr. Stevens for proposing the idea of sticking around for another hour to have this discussion specifically about reopening. I'm going to join him for that. Um, and we have some parents uh, joining us as well, which we're grateful to them for. Um, and hopefully the many of you who are here will, um, will stick around for that too, because it's, it's the topic that is clearly the most impressing one facing the district. And, um, and it's important to keep the conversation um, transparent and, and, and keep it going. So um, I'll stop there and turn it back over to Dr. Stevens. We're um, grateful to have his, his leadership um, at this time. And I'm looking forward to learning uh, a lot from his presentation. So I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, Ty Alper, president of the school board. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge that um, we're joined this evening by Jessica Lopez Teo, who's behind the scenes. She's done all of the logistical work to set up tonight's webinar, and she'll be providing some support as we engage with written questions uh, and live questions throughout the night. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the accomplishments um, for a few minutes. Um, this is um, really an effort to acknowledge the hard work of so many people um, to account for these truly exceptional circumstances that we've worked through and are working through. Um, one of the sort of remarkable accomplishments um, during this period of school closure has been uh, all the many staff and volunteers um, who are working to support our library program. Uh, Berkeley is very proud of its library program funded through BSEP, which is a local tax measure. Uh, the number that you see on your screen, more than 40,000, uh, this represents the number of books that we've been able to check out to students, um, even during the school closure um, period of time. There you can see an image from Thousand Oaks School, uh, excuse me, of volunteers um, preparing bags for pickup uh, for families who have uh, been able to select books online. Um, this has really been an act of creativity from our library staff and all of our volunteers. We're really appreciative of that work to be able to continue a library program, even though our libraries are physically closed right now. Uh, the library program as well has also um, still been engaging a whole variety of authors uh, to make presentations to our school children, albeit remotely. Uh, here you can see two images of well-known published children's book authors um, who are presenting to students um, at two of our schools. Again, a photo from Thousand Oaks School uh, and another from Al Malcolm X School. Uh, this has been a particularly successful element of the library's program. Uh, and each year, um, Jessica Lee, who is our coordinator of libraries, uh, invites in a number of well-known authors um, to be able to read to children and to speak to children about the way they found um, uh, the way they found themselves um, into a career as a children's book author, uh, and then the value of reading and writing uh, as they've become adults. So we're appreciative again of the library staff for making this possible for our students. Uh, also funded by the Berkeley School Excellence Program uh, is our Visual and Performing Arts and Music Program. Um, they have continued to soldier on through these circumstances uh, and have reconceptualized their program um, uh, taking place entirely remotely. Uh, here you can see an image of Shannon Houston's um, Longfellow Orchestra class taking place, place through Zoom. Um, this this um, entire program taking place at the middle school um, offers sort of an extension for our students who uh, participate in a universal grade four and five instrumental music instruction program. Um, this continues to be a very popular experience for middle school students, and we're appreciative to all of our music staff who have somehow figured out a way uh, to make it work, albeit not the same, but make it work even under these circumstances. 
Uh, and then another team of educators um, who have greatly enriched our school program, both when that program takes place on campus and in a virtual mode is our cooking, gardening and nutrition staff. Uh, this is a group of folks who are brought together um, through the support of the Berkeley soda tax. Um, this is a local tax that is then uh, portioned to the school district um, to support education related to gardening, related to um, healthy eating, uh, and generally to well-being. Uh, this has not been an easy task to convert a garden program into a meaningful online program, uh, and yet there's lots of reports from students that this is one of their favorite aspects of having to learn remote remotely. Um, here you can see a couple different ways uh, in which remote, is instru remote instruction is taking place. Um, there you can see the, the um, farm over on the left hand side, you can see the farm at Sylvia Mendez. Uh, and there's one of our gardening and cooking um, staff members, Mia, um, instructing on how to make it looks like either guacamole or a green salsa. Um, so we're just appreciative to all the folks in our gardening program who have continued on. And I know that they're very eager to begin working with students in person at the point that we can return. Uh, Berkeley Unified also has a very special office. It's called the Office of Family Engagement and Equity or OFI. Um, this is led by Supervisor Anne-Marie Caligari. Uh, and her team consists of a number of OFI liaisons, engagement liaisons, um, who work in our elementary schools and at our high school and at one of our middle schools, Longfellow, um, to be able to um, bridge the gap uh, between many of our families and the school communities that serve them. Uh, this year has seen a really dramatic increase in the amount of programming offered by OFI staff. Um, that programming includes an innovative new effort called the Black Parent and Principal Learning Circle. This is an uh, effort that brings in Robin Fisher, a, a local well-known uh, African-American educator, to support and facilitate conversations among Black uh, parents uh, and our own school principals. Um, through a series of readings, face-to-face um, -face interactions, um, and follow-up sessions, the Learning Circles intends to sort of illuminate some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that African-American families um, have here in our Berkeley schools. It's really meant to um, open up a level of understanding between our school leaders and the families they work with uh, and begin to articulate some of the unique needs and opportunities and strengths uh, of our Black families here in Berkeley. Um, OFI team has also uh, uh, begun to offer uh, a series of family support seminars uh, that are intended to uh, help families through this period of need and particularly through distance learning. Uh, this is new work for the team. We're really proud of them for conceiving of these seminars. So far, they've hosted three of them. Uh, and we've had well over 300 participants taking place in all of these seminars so far. And then finally, very exciting, um, we will be returning to our Black History Oratorical Festival. Uh, it was a year ago um, when we had um, our, our historical um, oratorical festival canceled because of this brand new thing called coronavirus. Um, so we have retooled um, the oratorical festival will be taking place online. Uh, this year's theme, Black Women Triumph, uh, is meant to support our students to engage in the idea of the contributions and, and the struggles of Black women, both here locally and in the United States. Uh, this is meant to elevate the contributions and accomplishments of African-American and Black women uh, around the globe and here in the country. We're excited about the theme and we're really grateful to the OFI team for leading us off in this direction. This is a representation of the intervention counseling team at um, Berkeley High School. There's three folks, um, you can see them uh, here. Um, this is a team at Berkeley High School that is meant to support um, students. They call them focal students. These are um, students who um, need just a little extra support, um, either social, emotional, or academic guidance um, to be able to fully access their classes and succeed at Berkeley High School. Um, this team, the team of three, serves 400 students and provides much needed extra attention to the students at Berkeley High School, in addition to the counseling team. Uh, you can see down at the bottom that they have logged over 4,400 direct contacts dur just during the first semester of this year. So congratulations to this team. We really appreciate the work that you do. 
Uh, we're also very grateful to the Schools Fund um, for their ongoing work to support the community through the Ed Hub. Uh, the Ed Hub has been an innovative and I think really inspiring um, sort of occurrence during the school closure period. It takes place uh, three times per week at Berkeley Adult School on San Pablo Avenue. Uh, here we've been able to distribute computers and hotspots, school materials, food, and many other items. Uh, over on the right hand side of the screen, you can see some of the impressive statistics about some distribution uh, items that have been distributed. And then down at the bottom, you can see some of the additional work that's taking place through the schools fund um, th and through the Ed Hub, including uh, lots of distance learning volunteer placements, uh, Zoom mentors, uh, and lots of one time volunteers who have been doing everything from task running um, to material setup. So this entire operation has filled a real gap for the community, uh, and we really um, want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Berkeley Schools Fund and all of our volunteers for making this possible. Uh, we've also been working hard to support the community um, through this period of need um, and a lot of food insecurity has been taking place here in Berkeley. Uh, this is a, a picture of several student groups who have been working throughout the pandemic um, to be sure um, that uh, families do have access to food. Um, this is a partnership and collaboration with local food pantries. And here you can see our students from Berkeley Technical Academy, uh, as well as BHS, um, who are getting CTE, that's Career Technical Education credit uh, in a public health class, um, as well as being offered paid internships uh, for this service um, in a very innovative collaboration. So there are a number of folks who deserve a lot of credit for this. Um, I'll nod my, um, sort of give a nod to Win Skills, particularly who has so much to do with the success of our career and technical ed programs here at Berkeley. Uh, our nutrition services team has been working very hard um, really since the first day of school closures. Um, they were right back at it on the very Monday morning that schools closed and they really have not relented since then. Um, this number that you see represented 200,064,000 meals um, is the total uh, meals served uh, just during this distance learning period. Uh, you know, it's notable that this is about a quarter of the um, sort of typical service number during um, the same period when schools are open. Um, we, that concerns us, but still this is an impressive number um, given all of the difficulties. And so we um, offer our thanks uh, to the nutrition services team and all of their workers um, for the uninterrupted service that they've provided to all of our families during distance learning. I mentioned career technical education a slide or two ago, and so let's pick up on that theme and talk a little bit more about this particular offering here in Berkeley. Um, Berkeley has a very well-developed program for CTE that takes place in our high school, and that has been increasingly having an impact on our middle school students as well. A whole variety of activities fall under the CTE umbrella uh, that include topics like coding, entrepreneurship, medicine, manufacturing, and law. Uh, and these particular topics have started to reach down into our middle schools. Um, we see them in like an entrepreneur um, uh, program at Willard uh, or the makerspace um, that was recently refurbished at Longfellow Middle School. Uh, instructors in our CTE program have found a way to continue their education remotely. Uh, and that education has in involved a variety of um, sort of activities well beyond the classroom. Uh, things like CAD design or EMT preparation. You can see the list there down on the bottom of the screen. So again, hats off to this team for their con uh, continued contribution to our students' education. Uh, in addition, we've continued to um, benefit from a long-standing partnership with Berkeley City College and our Berkeley Adult School. Uh, although these courses continue to operate remotely and likely will for, um, uh, for some time into the future, um, we're really proud of this partnership and especially appreciate um, the support that Berkeley Adult School uh, provides to our most recently arrived Berkeley residents uh, in the form of um, ESL courses that articulate into Berkeley City College. Uh, we're really glad to have this additional resource for the adult members of our learning community. And I'm glad that both of these institutions is able to serve a regional base, not just uh, folks here in Berkeley, but really attract um, uh, members of the community from all over the East Bay. Uh, over the summer, the Board of Education passed a very ambitious and forward-reaching Black Lives Matter resolution. 
Um, that resolution defines a number of lines of work, including an attention to board policy, um, uh, calls for additional investment in programs to specifically support African American and Black students here in Berkeley, uh, professional development, and among other things, um, a call to celebrate Black Lives Matter at Schools Week, uh, which is taking place next week, February 1st through the 5th. Um, the Board of Education uh, next week will be receiving a report um, from staff about the variety of activities that all of our schools uh, have planned for next week. Um, they include particular history lessons, uh, read alouds, opportunities to interact with authors, and just generally explore the contributions of Black Americans to this country uh, and to our city. So we're very glad that all of our schools have embraced this effort, and this is really meant to contribute uh, to what should be a very robust Black Black History Month, uh, as well as an ongoing commitment by the district to explore themes in Black history, uh, math, literature, uh, throughout the course of our curriculum. So um, consider this to be an extension of work that's been going on for many years, and we thank all of our school communities for their full engagement in this effort. Uh, the Bridge Program uh, is another one of those very unique programs taking place at Berkeley High School. Um, this has been um, a longstanding program along with RISE uh, that seeks to serve um, first generation college goers. Um, they boast a very strong graduation rate um, and college acceptance rate. You can see the stat down there at the bottom of the screen. Both of these programs, Bridge and Rise, um, uh, cater to the needs of African-American and Latinx students as they're making their way through Berkeley High School uh, and into higher education settings. Uh, so to all of the staff um, who support our students through both of these programs, uh, thank you very much for the work. And we really appreciate your ongoing con contribution to these students' education through the school closure period. We're also proud that as part of the Black Lives Matter resolution um, that we engaged last semester in a successful school renaming process. Um, uh, in June, the Board of Education voted to dename de uh, two of our elementary schools, that's Jefferson and Washington, uh, with the notion uh, that, that here in Berkeley, um, we seek to honor the contributions of uh, local luminaries uh, while also um, trying to uh, reconcile ourselves to the slave owning past of both Washington and Jefferson. Uh, so with the denaming de de decision completed back in the summer, uh, the Jefferson community launched its first engagement process, um, first of the two. Um, to begin exploring a variety of candidate names. Uh, and after months of deliberation with students, parents, and staff at Jefferson, uh, the name Ruth Acti uh, was very proudly selected. Uh, Ruth Acti was the first uh, Black educator, Black teacher here in Berkeley. Um, she was hired back in the 40s um, after several years working as a, um, essentially as an aide in the district. Um, and it is a uh, sort of, uh, she led a um, remarkable life um, and contributed in many ways to the Berkeley community. So this, I think, is um, sort of a, a real note of accomplishment, both for the school board, for the former Jefferson community, now Ruth Acta community, and something that all of us in Berkeley can be proud of. Um, during the next semester, we're intending to take a little hiatus from our school naming activities in light of all of the various work in front of us, but we're looking forward to re-engaging with the Washington school community um, to begin this uh, very similar process to uh, explore potential uh, uh, names for the school, uh, and then eventually to make a recommendation to the Board of Education sometime during the 21-22 school year. Uh, at Longfellow School, we're proud of a new program that's been um, uh, sort of launched by Mr. Kamar Ogwin. It's called the Omoja Program. Uh, here you see pictured Mr. Ogwin uh, and then Mr. Christopher Oakes, um, who's an instructor uh, in the Omoja elective class. Uh, this is a class uh, that is meant to um, center on Black culture and history uh, as a way of enriching the educational experience of students at Longfellow School. Uh, we're looking forward to expanding this program. Uh, and in effect, it sort of takes many of the positive attributes of the Emoja program at Berkeley City College or the Black Studies Department at Berkeley High School uh, and creates that experience for African-American students in our middle school. Um, so to both of you, our profound thanks for your leadership and your contributions in the development of this district program. And we look forward to seeing it expanded soon. Uh, also over the summer, the board very proudly passed a, a, a policy related to supporting transgender and gender nonconforming students. Um, this particular policy builds on previous board policy uh, and asks for um, professional development, uh, educational opportunities for students, 
uh, and makes wide ranging calls for schools to identify um, all of through a variety of practices, uh, ways in which we are welcoming of all of our students, uh, irrespective of gender identity. Um, this work is uh, ongoing in district and we look forward to the ways in which the recently passed policy will amplify that work uh, and really continue to touch both educators, families and students as they experience our schools. Uh, we're also proud, this is um, uh, news just of this week, um, we'll be announcing on Friday um, that we are now the recipients of a half million dollar grant uh, offered to Berkeley Unified by both Bayer and Wareham Development um, to be able to diversify the STEM pipeline, the um, uh, science, technology, education, uh, sorry, engineering and math pipeline. Uh, this particular grant uh, is meant to support underrepresented students um, uh, to aspire to careers in the STEM field. Um, this will um, particularly offer, uh, offer opportunities to high school and middle school age students. And this is all funded um, or rather sort of falls under the umbrella of our career and technical education program that I mentioned earlier. Uh, particular uh, congratulations to Aaron Rhodes at the School Above Fund and to Win Skills again. And our thanks to Bayer and Wareham for their gift to Berkeley Unified. So with that, um, having covered a great many of the accomplishments, um, I wanna note that it's always really hard to come up with a list of accomplishments because there are so many. And I appreciate um, for everybody who's listening that you um, sort of let us honor the contributions of our educators, our students, um, our families, um, before we start to talk about some of the, the other items going on. Uh, if you've just joined in, um, uh, th this is the um, first part of a two-part um, meeting this evening. Uh, from six to seven this evening, we're hosting what we're calling the State of the District meeting. This is an annual meeting that serves as the launch of the school budgeting and planning process. Um, I'll touch just briefly as part of this first hour on school reopening. Uh, and if it's school reopening that's of particular interest to you this evening, I hope that you'll stay tuned between seven and eight, uh, where we plan to invite a number of our parents to join us as uh, co-panelists. And we will have just an open, unscripted, candid conversation about the issues associated with school reopening. So please know if this particular slide or bit of information that I share just in the next minute or two doesn't feel fully satisfying, uh, that there's another full hour devoted to this topic starting at seven o'clock tonight. So to talk just a little bit about school reopening, uh, we continue to be in a really dynamic environment. Um, there are changes taking place um, nearly constantly, and that includes really major changes that have taken place even in the last 10 days as they relate to reopening thresholds established by the state, uh, and even as they relate to the availability of vaccinations um, for our educators. So I'll try to unpack each of these um, in just a couple of minutes, knowing that we'll talk in depth at seven o'clock about all of this. So um, to begin, over on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we've been keeping uh, track on a week-by-week -week basis of the district's progress towards completing a whole variety of uh, tasks associated with preparing our facilities and our staff to reopen into a hybrid model. Uh, anybody from the community who's interested in seeing an updated version of this dashboard um, can log on to our website and from our main page, uh, very easily connect to the dashboard. You can also Google BUSD readiness dashboard and it will uh, also take you to that page. Um, the dashboard over time has changed. Um, in the earlier stages of the fall semester, um, there were a great many tasks um, that we were still working on. They included things like um, preparing sneeze guards in all of our um, facilities, including our offices, um, and even more difficult tasks like um, developing a contact tracing operation through the hiring of new staff um, or standing up a staff testing program. Um, essentially by identifying a partner organization and then designing that protocol for staff testing. More and more, we've been able to display that these items are prepared. Um, and so we've known for a while um, that we're getting closer and closer. Uh, at the beginning of December, though, uh, the entire country was plunged into a really dramatic spike in transmission of COVID-19. That was true here in Berkeley. Um, and early in November, um, we were subject to a stay-at-home order um, that essentially suspended all activity with respect to school reopening. Um, that stay-at-home order is now over, um, having endured about seven weeks of that order. Uh, and we're now back into um, the sort of previously published set of permissions about school reopening um, with one key change. And that's what I'd like to walk you through. 
Um, just um, on, uh, I think it was January 1st, in fact, so a couple of weeks ago, um, Governor Newsom uh, modified the permission, the threshold rate uh, at which schools would get permission to reopen. Uh, previously, schools could get permission to reopen when the um, case rate, the transmission rate, was lower than seven cases uh, per 100,000 residents in a county. Um, uh, based on the science, um, after a more thorough review of all of the data coming in, uh, the state has uh, changed the reopening threshold from seven cases per 100,000 to 25 cases per 100,000. Uh, they've also shortened the wait time uh, once that transmission rate is achieved. Uh, it used to be that once we achieved the seven cases per 100,000 that we would have to wait a month. Uh, that wait time is now modified to five days. So it may be the case that in very short order, we will be regaining our permission to reopen elementary schools. Um, uh, for those of you tracking transmission rates, you'll know that we're on sort of a slow downward um, trend now. Uh, and it may be possibly um, by next week or the week following that we will have achieved this 25 cases per 100,000 rate. So uh, I think we're again uh, approaching the window by, at which we would receive uh, permission from the public health department to reopen elementary schools. Uh, the state has also modified the reopening permissions for middle and high schools. Um, that is now given when the transmission rates uh, reach the red tier. Again, we're going to go through this a lot at seven o'clock, uh, but that's a change also in the permissions. There is, however, no change uh, in the sort of legal framework that requires all public school districts in California uh, to reach uh, formal and signed agreements with all of our labor partners, our unions. Um, so even with permission, we must have a signed and ratified agreement uh, in order to uh, reopen our schools. I'll talk much more about labor agreements, um, about bargaining at seven o'clock, uh, but do know it's both of these things together um, that ultimately result in the ability of a public school district um, to open. And these are somewhat different conditions in private schools. Uh, private schools are not required to negotiate with employees. And so it does um, sort of add an additional step uh, to the work that public schools are required to do. Uh, down in the pink, uh, as we talk about testing and vaccines, um, we are now uh, fully operational with a testing program that gives all of our staff access to a COVID-19 test every two weeks. Um, and we are now in development uh, with a, a separate partner uh, of a student testing program. We are aiming at the point that we have students back on our campus also to offer an on-campus COVID-19 test at the rate of once per two week period. Uh, and then uh, there has been a lot of sort of confusion expressed in the local media um, uh, about educator vaccines. About a week ago, it appeared um, that educators were jumping to the top of a list um, that was going to refer to as phase 1B. Um, uh, it is true that educators are in phase 1B, which is the sort of next phase in the vaccination distribution. Uh, but just as of this week, uh, the state modified phase 1B to include all individuals over the age of 65, uh, thereby increasing the target population for phase 1B by millions of people. Um, and as we understand it, just again from sort of consumers of popular media, uh, this has produced a lot of confusion and a lot of difficulty for the organizations that are managing vaccination distribution. Uh, those organizations include county health offices uh, as well as HMOs uh, who will be tasked with distributing vaccines to educators. So right now, as of this evening, um, we're in a wait and see mode. We simply don't have information yet about when the city of Berkeley may have doses available for our educators educators or when Kaiser and Sutter, the two sort of largest healthcare providers in our area, uh, may be at the point that they can offer vaccines to educators specifically. Uh, I am aware of what's going on in Marin. We can talk lots more about that at seven o'clock, but I wanted to offer this update about school reopening uh, just for now. And again, if you're just joining in, I hope you'll stay tuned at seven o'clock where we'll talk only about school reopening uh, in a much less scripted, much less presentation style manner. Uh, let me touch uh, for a moment on state funding. Um, this is uh, very relevant um, to Berkeley and all public schools. Uh, we are dependent for the lion's share of our funding on the state of California. And we've been through sort of a tough period over the last three years, uh, including what was um, uh, sort of a real scrape with disaster last year. Um, we thought through the better part of the spring that we were staring at a 10% reduction in our general fund revenue. 
uh, which could have meant devastating cuts here in Berkeley. And we were really saved at the 11th hour by a compromise between the governor and the legislature, uh, which allowed us to sort of continue on. No new funding, uh, but we were able to manage this year um, with significant cuts, but not deep cuts to classrooms and programs. If we take a look at what's been going on over the last three years, you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, our sort of downward trend in uh, um, revenue had really started in the 1819 school year. Uh, it was at that point that the Board of Education was forced to wrestle with a $1.8 million cut. Um, that cut was then combined in 1920 uh, with an additional $1.9 million of reductions. Uh, and then last year, although we avoided disaster, um, we still were forced to reduce $5.1 million in spending. Uh, that's a combined revenue reduction here in Berkeley Unified of $8.8 .8 million. Uh, and this is, represents a significant downturn in our funding over the last um, three years. This represents uh, about 8% or so uh, of the total amount of money that we get from the state um, to run all of our education programs. So um, while I am optimistic about the news for next year, we have to keep in mind that this downward trend has been having this sort of slow erosive effect uh, on our school district and on public education here in California. And so for folks who are sort of avid followers of news in Sacramento, um, I encourage you to stay active um, with local legislators uh, and to express your concern about school funding still. We, um, we continue to have needs. This year, uh, moving into the 21-22 school year, um, the outlook appears to be better. Uh, I wouldn't call it great, but it, it is certainly better. Um, the governor is in his January budget proposal um, has um, stated that schools should receive a 3.8% cost, um, cost of living adjustment. Um, you can call that COLA for short. Uh, what this means um, is an increase in revenue of about $3.3 million um, for Berkeley Unified. This doesn't translate into $3.3 million of available funding. We can't just spend that amount. Uh, we continue to be in an environment where many of our expenses are rising, such as transportation costs, utilities, um, salaries, uh, as well as um, special education costs. And so we have work to do now as staff um, to calculate exactly what portion of that $3.3 million might be available for new spending, what portion of that might will likely be um, sort of consumed by rising costs. Um, I think that this is going to have the effect of blunting budget reductions, um, but we're just a little bit too early in our own calculations to understand that for certain. Um, for folks who would like to contribute to the um, construction of the school district's budget um, for the coming school year, there's a number of ways that you can be involved. And let me talk a little bit about what those are. Um, generally, over the course of the next six months, um, we'll be going through a number of um, sort of customary phases associated with planning and making budget allocations. Uh, January is the typical date in which we're reviewing budget numbers, we're beginning to develop reduction targets if we need them. Uh, by February, the Board of Education will be uh, turning its attention to identifying high-level priorities for the 21-22 school year, uh, including costs associated with school reopening. Um, and then uh, the school, dist uh, school board will be asking staff, advisory committees, and the community to join together to begin to develop options uh, that would um, satisfy the high-level priorities articulated by the Board of Education. Uh, those options are eventually sort of developed and winnowed down into a set of proposals that will begin making their way to the Board of Education in March and April and May. Uh, and as the board sort of successively makes um, um, uh, or approves these proposals or potentially rejects them and asks for more thinking, um, we will work our way towards uh, the construction of a budget. Uh, and by June, uh, we will have a fully uh, a balanced general fund budget as well as a balanced um, LCAP budget, a local control accountability plan budget as well. Um, so there's lots of committees that um, feed into this work. But before I talk about those, let me give you some examples of some of the high level priorities uh, that the board so far has articulated or that are coming from a variety of corners of the district. Um, they include um, ongoing commitment to the Black Lives Matter resolution passed by the board in the summer uh, and a desire to expand our family engagement capacities through the Office of Family uh, Engagement and Equity. 
uh, uh, a desire to see ethnic studies instituted in our schools, uh, commitment to gender equity. Uh, I mention this because of um, very public work led by our Berkeley High School students in the spring of last year, just prior to school closure, um, to identify, sort of elevate as a priority concerns about sexual harassment uh, and about education related to consent. Um, so this work is ongoing. It's named here as part of a sort of a portfolio of high, the high level priorities for the board's consideration starting next week. I've also mentioned to you work that we intend to do to deepen our commitment to equity for transgender and gender non-conforming students. Um, there is work to do on learning loss, on how to um, support students to recover from what is the sort of tragedy of isolation. Um, that includes both academic support, but it also includes emotional support, counseling, um, and frankly, just increased programming for the purpose of sort of returning students to a sense of normalcy and safety. Support for Latinx students is also included on this list, as is improvements to our early literacy program, work with our labor partners, both on school reopening and other issues, uh, and mathematics, um, which has been sort of a longstanding call in the community to think deeply about the way that we're teaching math as a sequence uh, through elementary, middle, and high school students. So these particular slides are not meant to be inclusive of all possible priorities, but they represent a number of ideas that have been important to the Berkeley community for several years. Uh, and that we'll begin to talk through at the board level starting next week. Um, I hope that you'll look out uh, not only for budget um, uh, opportunities to be engaged with the budget, but um, there are uh, four other sort of key um, topics that we plan to do some significant work on over the course of, over the course of this semester. Um, they include the development of a new three-year local control and accountability plan that's called the LCAP. This particular plan uh, is meant to support three more vulnerable populations in our school district. They include English language learners, students who receive free and reduced lunch, and uh, foster youth. So for folks who are passionate about this issue, we encourage you to look out for opportunities um, through in the form of town halls to contribute to the development of that plan. Um, we will also be working on uh, what's called the English Learner Master Plan. Uh, this is a document that intends to um, guide schools in the district uh, in the effective support of our English learners. We have about 500 students who are English learners in the district. And this plan uh, describes everything from the placement of those students, their enrollment, um, how they are identified and assessed, um, all the way through how they are reclassified as English fluent students. And I'm going to take just a moment to talk a little bit in Spanish just about this particular element. Uh, muy buenas noches a todos ustedes que hablan español. Quisiera uh, proveer a ustedes un anuncio de que estaremos nosotros uh, involucrados en la revisión del plan maestro de los aprendices de inglés. Uh, espero que para todos los hispanohablantes que les interese este plan, uh, que estén um, avisados o, o que estén buscando avisos desde el distrito um, sobre cómo estar involucrado en esta revisión. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, and then we planned uh, two more um, sort of community engagement efforts, one around middle school student assignment and the other around uh, development of an African American success framework. Um, I know that this feels like a very crowded semester for lots of you. We plan to look in lots of places for support. Um, our primary commitment is to school reopening. I think that you'll see that in, um, throughout the conversation, especially at seven o'clock. Um, but in any case, the district continues. And so there are a number of important bodies of work that we're looking forward to taking on uh, while we also say standard on this goal of getting our students back in school. Um, here is a representation of that timeline um, for folks who are interested to know when we begin, uh, when we'll begin to communicate. Um, you can see in February, we plan to begin to issue communication to the community about getting involved in the LCAP and the EL master plan. Uh, and by the time we get to March, um, we'll be communicating in earnest about opportunities to contribute to the middle school student assignment process, uh, as well as the development of an African American success framework. Uh, so with that, um, we arrive at the end of my presentation. I really appreciate you sort of hanging in there through a lot of content. Um, uh, what we're planned to do for the next 15 minutes is um, pop into the Q&A. Uh, and I believe as well that we'll have an opportunity uh, if there are any folks who would like to ask live questions during this first portion, during the um, State of the District meeting, uh, I think that we'll have an opportunity to do that as well. 
Uh, if you have just joined in, um, please know that we've kind of designed tonight's meeting in two parts. Uh, we're just coming to the close of the first part, which is the annual state of the district meeting. Uh, this is the annual launch of our planning and um, sort of, uh, budget building cycle. And then at seven o'clock after a very quick stretch break, um, we're gonna uh, be joined by a number of parent panelists. We've invited four parents from different uh, elementary schools here in the district um, to come live on screen. And we plan to have an unscripted, very candid dialogue about school reopening. So that'll take place shortly after seven o'clock. And until then, uh, we'll engage in a little bit of Q&A as, as folks have tapped out questions um, in Zoom. And I think we can take a couple of live questions as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, and just to say who this is, um, this is uh, the, the childhood Kamala Harris. Um, our congratulations to her on her um, uh, inauguration as the Vice President of the United States. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Jessica, maybe you could help take us over to some of the written questions. Um, and then uh, for folks who are interested in, um, I think you've got your ability to raise hand uh, for folks who might want to ask a live question during this portion of our meeting, uh, you're very welcome to do so. OK, um, the first qu question is from Eliza. And it reads, what are the district's plans for mitigating learning loss, especially for high need students? Uh, it's a great question. I know we'll talk more about it at seven. Um, this is something that we have actually been working on um, quite a bit. So we have a number of partner organizations identified that we um, will be contracting with to be able to greatly expand the number of seats available in a whole variety of programs. Um, they include, for example, um, an organization uh, called, uh, it's the RT Fisher Enterprises and Area. Um, they offer a program called STEM Steps. Um, this is sort of a hands-on and engaging science program uh, that will begin to offer seats over the course of this semester and then throughout the summer. Um, that same organization is being brought on board to offer tutoring opportunities for students, and we're looking forward to articulating how to get involved in those. We're also in conversations with organizations like the Lawrence Hall of Science, uh, Camp Edmo, who we worked with last summer, uh, the City of Berkeley, as well as our own educators. And then we're working um, to develop a series of clinics um, using providers like Wilson and Slingerland um, that will um, provide very specific targeted support for students who are struggling with reading development uh, and with math. Um, we're still a little bit early in being able to articulate the sort of full catalog of those resources, uh, but we are looking forward to um, offering a greatly expanded set of resources related to, um, related to uh, learning loss. Uh, and then I should also mention that, um, you know, learning loss sort of has a second component, and that is not only sort of academic learning loss, but just has to do with the overall impact, the emotional impact of um, this isolating experience. Um, so we're also um, sort of cataloging right now, we're doing an inventory of mental health services in the district um, with an eye towards making sure that we have um, a good number of additional resources that we can offer through schools um, to families who need them. There are many resources now, and for any family who's concerned about their child, I encourage you to reach out um, to your school. All of our students, or sorry, all of our schools have contracts with um, mental health providers. Uh, and those resources uh, are available, I really do encourage you to reach out, um, describe what's going on with your child, uh, and seek support through your school. Um, Jessica, why don't we uh, take another one? Yes, uh, first I just wanted to say that uh, President Alper will join us again at 7 p.m. Um, another question is from Rachel Toby. Uh, how much money for reopening could be the USD apply from the $2 billion grant program offered by the state? Yeah, really good question. Um, so let me give a bit of background on this one. So um, Governor Newsom uh, on his January 1st um, news conference announced uh, the sort of advent of a new $2 billion grant program. Uh, it's called the In-Person Instruction Grant. Uh, it's meant to provide financial incentives for public school districts uh, in order to reopen. Um, as part of sort of articulating this grant opportunity, he created a few prerequisites um, that school districts would have to satisfy in order to apply. Um, and there were two of them um, that have turned out to be really daunting. Uh, one of them has to do with having signed agreements with labor unions prior to application, prior to February 1st. 
Uh, and the second has to do with a, um, having a fully operational student COVID-19 testing program, uh, also by February 1st. Uh, if you're following the news on this, um, Governor Newsom is um, taking quite a bit of heat around the state um, about the unrealistic timeline, uh, including his own um, uh, LAO, the um, Legislative Analyst Office, um, sort of critiquing the plan for what has been described as just inadequate time. Um, I don't see that Berkeley or really any other district is going to be applying under these particular conditions. Um, I think, in fact, that there's a, um, an entire rethink going on in Sacramento about the way the $2 billion should be deployed. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't argue that it's a grant program. I think we need those dollars, um, which incidentally are part of Proposition 98 funding for schools anyways. We need the money, uh, no matter what, in order to be ready to reopen. And so I'd prefer that it just be made available. So um, that was a bit long-winded, but I don't think the grant program is viable. I think it will be reconstructed. And I know that we will not be applying for those grants. Okay. Uh, question from Sarah Bowles. Um, with enrollment down by 7.5% and likely to decline further, what impact will this have on our budget going forward? Yeah, um, really excellent question. Um, so around the state, um, there has been a pretty dramatic uh, decline in state enrollment. In fact, EdSource just today um, did an article about um, enrollment decline in districts around California. This has been a pervasive uh, problem. Um, our overall uh, enrollment decline is just over 7%, which is very dramatic um, for a single school year. Uh, and we don't have access to a lot of data. There's not a statewide database that helps us understand the movement of families around the state or out of the state. Um, but we know anecdotally that families have done a number of things. Um, some families were displaced for economic reasons during the pandemic. Others um, uh, elected other programs, private programs or um, alternative programs. Some left the area uh, and some have opted to homeschool as an alternative to distance learning. Um, I'm optimistic that we're going to return, um, perhaps not to full enrollment, but I think as we um, sort of round the corner um, towards the fall where we're able to get um, far closer to normal, um, that many families are recognizing that Berkeley is the place they want their children to be educated in, uh, will return to us. Um, for next year, though, um, we do know that the state has allowed districts um, to uh, be held harmless with respect to student enrollment. So even if we don't see that enrollment bump next year, um, we do expect that that cost of living adjustment, the one that I described, uh, will be based on our pre-pandemic enrollment. And for at least one year, um, we are not going to experience any financial setback due to enrollment decreases. Um, the next question is uh, from Stephanie Green. What are the principal components being considered for the African American Success Framework? Uh, it's a, a wonderful question. Um, over the course of about, um, well, many more than five years, actually, since um, 2014 and even before, um, BUSD has had a number of initiatives uh, designed to support African-American students. Um, I think about, uh, for example, the development of an equity um, matrix that had been included in the 2014 um, uh, LCAP. Um, we also have the Black Studies Department. We have the Emoja program. Uh, and the, the goal of the development of the framework is to really articulate a vision um, for a way the district would comprehensively support African-American students and families. So as um, elements of that framework, I imagine um, uh, things like uh, tutoring and mentoring opportunities, as well as career exploration. Uh, I imagine as well investment in identity-based programming like Umoja, uh, not only at the middle school, but up and down uh, the range of our schools. Uh, and then I'm also imagining uh, elements like uh, bias uh, education for our educators, um, a theme that is very consistently articulated by families of color uh, as having a direct impact on students here in Berkeley. Uh, the point of bringing somebody in to help us develop the framework is really to coalesce the best thinking in the community so that we have a clear, coherent way uh, to design programming and invest as a district over a long period so that we get results, um, uh, that th the results that we want and that, that our students deserve. I think I have time for a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to read uh, one from SF Birth Center. Um, Hi, I understand that you'll be discussing elementary reopening possibilities in the next hour. Will there be any discussion planned for middle school and high school in-person schooling? COVID-19 is uh, one risk, but these students are suffering real mental health setbacks. 
in addition to, of course, the learning loss you're discussing. And then they posted uh, an article from the New York Times. Um, the answer is yes. Um, uh, we're intending uh, to have just an unscripted dialogue for the next hour. Um, there are some topics that I would like to cover in the next hour. They include vaccinations, um, they include bargaining, uh, how it works, why it works the way it does, um, its impact on the overall school reopening process. I also plan to talk about sort of why there are differences between private and public schools or other districts, uh, and then offer my best perspective on reopening prospects um, this spring and in the fall for elementary, middle, and high school. Um, so we will go where the conversation takes us. Um, there's really sort of no limits um, on uh, the questions that we might be able to explore in the next hour. Okay, um, there is a question from A, uh, Ben. She, um, we hope that you keep the virtual component so more of us can regularly attend. Dr. Stevens, please talk about the athletics training conditioning program. I have a child in tennis at BHS and haven't heard about this. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. So we, um, for a few months, I think we started on November 6th of last year, um, uh, an athletic conditioning program. Uh, so in keeping with all of the guidelines established by the city public health officer, uh, that program has been running uninterrupted, um, even through this um, sort of spike. Uh, our elementary cohort programs have also been running uninterrupted. Uh, we got good news from the California Interscholastic Federation just last week um, that we will begin a series of competitive sports. Um, they've articulated uh, sort of a tiered system for reintroducing athletic uh, competition. Uh, so I know we'll beginning, uh, beginning next week, in fact, um, uh, folks at Berkeley High School should begin to um, hear from our athletic directors uh, about tennis, about cross country, uh, two other sports, I can't remember, um, sort of low contact sports. Uh, and then as we move from purple to red to orange, uh, we'll be introducing uh, other athletics opportunities as well. Really regrettably, um, there is no news about sort of comp competitive sports that continues to be prohibited. That is teams will not be playing other schools. Um, and I'm not optimistic actually that that will be part of our spring experience, uh, but they have permitted teams to begin forming, um, to scrimmage, to practice. Uh, and that's good news for our student athletes as we um, move towards, um, you know, step-by-step -step move towards reopening. And Jess, let's take um, just one more question and then we'll have a quick stretch break and kind of reconvene for our second hour. Okay, so I have a couple announcements too. Uh, the first one is that we have reached capacity. So we are live on Facebook. So if you hear from people that have not been able to uh, get on the webinar, they can go on our Facebook, uh, excuse me, our YouTube page and find us there. And the second is just to remind uh, the four families, parents that are going to join us to raise your hands so that I can promote you as panelists for the next uh, level. Um, let me uh, find a question. Um, now that we are uh, from Rachel Toby, now that we are deep into the year of distance learning, is BUSD planning to go back to school on Wednesdays or during the summer to make up for the learning loss inability to complete grade level curricula given the shortening of instruction hours? Uh, also a good question. Um, so we're right now in discussions about what those Wednesdays should look like. Um, we get sort of mixed feedback on those Wednesdays. I think our educators appreciate having them to work with small groups of kids who are falling behind. Um, some students, I think, appreciate the break in the distance learning day, while others do not. Um, they find them pretty boring. Uh, and our teachers, I think, are sort of a mixed view about those Wednesdays. Um, some appreciate the opportunity for small group support. Um, and some planning, collaboration, and others I think would like to just teach more. Um, so we are in dialogue about what those Wednesdays could look like. I'm not right now able to sort of commit to any change, um, but as part of thinking about what's coming in this next semester, Wednesdays are definitely on the table. So Jessica, I'm gonna um, propose that we take a very quick stretch break. Um, I'd like to just get up and stretch my legs. Um, it's seven o'clock now for folks who have just joined us. Uh, we're concluding the first hour of time together. Uh, that's the conclusion of the state of the district address. This is an annual sort of budget and planning launch meeting um, that we conduct each year. Uh, we're transitioning now to what will feel like a very different kind of interaction. Uh, we're just right now in the process of bringing um, several of our own BUSD parents on board as panelists. Uh, and as soon as we have this stretch break, um, we'll introduce uh, all of our parent guests, our school board members, 
uh, and then set the stage for a conversation uh, in which parents will be able to ask questions, offer commentary, uh, and we'll continue to stay engaged with everybody who's watching by looking out for live questions um, and by uh, reading questions aloud from the Q&A box. So let's take uh, about 120 seconds. Um, everybody can get up from the first hour. Uh, and then we will be right back and begin a second hour together talking about school reopening. So please stand by and we'll be right back. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks very much for indulging just a, a quick little break. Um, if you are just logging on, uh, welcome to every single one of you. Um, this is the second hour of a two hour sort of engagement this evening. The first hour was a state of the district address. Second hour is really intended to be sort of an extended and unscripted dialogue. Um, we have invited a number of our BUSD parents representing a few different school communities uh, and a few different points of view about the topic of school reopening to join us. Uh, we're also joined this evening by a couple of our school board members. Uh, that's uh, Director Laura Babbitt and School Board President Ty Alper. Uh, so what I'd propose to do is um, uh, some introductions uh, so that everybody knows who our parent panelists are. Um, and then I'll um, sort of lay out a few topics um, that I think may be of interest. Um, and then parent panelists, um, we didn't get a chance to rehearse anything, did we? Um, so here you are. Uh, and so I'm really gonna lean on each of you just to sort of represent um, your own perspectives as parents, um, the questions that you're hearing in the community. Uh, and I'm also gonna just encourage you not to hold back. Um, I know that there's a lot of tension in our community right now. Um, uh, a lot of folks are feeling upset and angry. Uh, and we sort of find ourselves in, in you know, what might be reasonably described as a bit of a crisis moment uh, related to public education here in Berkeley. Um, so the point of this conversation is to, to be honest with each other, to provide candid information. Um, I'm gonna do my very best um, to share everything that I know or I'm thinking about. Uh, and you all are sort of welcome to ask questions, amplify ideas, push me, push board members, really for the benefit of the hundreds of parents um, who have logged on tonight, hoping to learn a lot more about what's going on. Uh, does that feel fair, parent panelists? Okay. Um, so let's um, first jump in. Um, if you didn't get a chance just to um, be introduced to her earlier, um, special thanks to Jessica Lopez tonight, who's just handling all of the complicated logistics we couldn't do tonight without you. And thanks, Jess, for your help. Uh, let's first introduce um, our parents, if uh, we could. And I'll just sort of pick you out in the order you appear on my screen. Claudia, would you mind introducing yourself to, our, to all of the folks watching? Sure. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Thumbs up. Yeah. Yes, that's so easy. My name is Claudia Ezierre. I am the mother of a fourth grader at Silvia Mendez and a sixth grader at Willard Middle School. I have lived in Berkeley since 1994. Um, I, first, I volunteered in the classroom as a college student at Washington School with a teacher whose name I wish rem I remembered. She was amazing. And I can say that I love the Berkeley Public Schools and I count Berkeley Public School teachers among my closest friends. Several of them are my closest friends. And I was invited today because I have really been working hard to try to get my children and the children I know who need to get back to school. Uh, thank you for being with us, Claudia. Thanks for saying yes. Uh, and Vicki, you're next on my screen. 
Hi, my name is Vicki Davis. Um, I have a first grader at Malcolm X Elementary and I have a seventh grader at Longfellow Middle School. Um, I have a child with an IEP and I am the president of PTAs at both schools. Um, and I am happy to be at this panel. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Hollis, good evening to you. Good evening. Um, hi, my name is Hollis Williams. I'm a proud parent of two children at Thousand Oaks Elementary. Um, my son's in fourth grade and I have a kindergartner who started her year at home. Um, um, and we're just trying to get through things here. Um, I'm a proud um, Berkeley resident. I've been here for a long time. Um, I also work in uh, county government. So I do have some insight about things that are going on local government level. Um, and I'm a social worker at heart too. So, um, and one last thing, my sister, and I has been an uh, employee of Berkeley Unified for over 20 years at Thousand Oaks. So I have a lot of connections to that school as well. Uh, here's a fun fact for you, Hollis. I did my student teaching at Thousand Oaks Elementary School in 1993. Oh, that's great. Well, you probably know my sister in law Back in the day. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, Shamik, good evening to you. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm, my name is Shamik Dasgupta. I have uh, two daughters in the system, uh, one at uh, BAM Elementary in fourth grade uh, and uh, another daughter in sixth grade at King uh, Middle School. Um, we uh, love the Berkeley School District. It's just, it's such a beacon of uh, public education. Um, and I really want to thank you for organizing this conversation. I mean, you're absolutely right that um, this is such a strange time. Uh, people have different opinions about this issue and conversation is just essential to, um, it's, it's essential to keep the conversation going, to exchange ideas, to exchange opinions. So thank you so much for, for organizing this. Uh, very glad to do it. And thanks to you all as well for agreeing to, to join in and help us make this happen. Um, and then if I could go to uh, Laura Babbitt, a uh, recently appointed member of the school board. Welcome to you, Director Babbitt. Thank you so much. I'm also a parent. I've had a Longfellow and Berkeley High School graduate. And boy, I still got a fifth grader. So I'm still in here for a long time. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, and to Ty Alper, uh, school board president. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who's here. I wanted to mention that um, we're at capacity. We have 500 people on the Zoom, um, but we're live streaming on YouTube also. So if any of your friends are calling you or texting you and saying that it, the link is closed, just tell them to go to the um, BUSD YouTube site. The link is, in, is on Twitter, our, our Twitter and Facebook also. So um, everybody will can see it, but they, the Zoom is, is closed, which is um, I think a good probably jumping off point for the discussion, Dr. Stevens, because it's an indication of um, how how critical this issue is and how how invested our community is in it. I agree. And thank you for organizing this. I, I also really appreciate you inviting our parents and um, and Director Babbitt and myself to join you. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that we're doing this. Um, so let me try to sort of lay out some of the terrain that we might cover. Um, and these are just sort of broad topics. I hadn't really planned um, a lot of remarks, um, but would really like to just let the conversation unfold naturally between us. Um, I do know that there's been uh, sort of lots of questions in the community about labor unions, about negotiation, um, and particularly about Berkeley Federation of Teachers, our teachers union. Um, I do know that this has sort of been um, a sort of source of speculation about what's going on, that it's really sort of bargaining that's blocking the way. So that that's a topic that I think we could explore over the next hour. Uh, I know vaccines as well, and vaccines for educators, particularly in the way that they might serve as a key to reopening schools, um, is a topic that we can explore. Um, I'm also thinking about hybrid learning, um, sort of why is it that the district has provide, uh, proposed the particular model that it has, um, uh, what's going on behind that sort of proposal. Um, and there's, uh, so that's sort of another element, I think, of both questions and some level of dissatisfaction in the community, so probably worth trying to touch there. Um, there are there are sort of lots of um, sort of comparisons taking place in communication about what the differences between places like San Diego and Marin uh, and Berkeley in the Bay Area. Uh, so that's a topic worth exploring. There's also lots of contrasting uh, between private schools and public schools. Um, and so we could go there as well. Um, and then um, I do know that lots of folks are just sort of wishing that there was a roadmap um, for this next six month period or the next year long period. Um, the anxiety is killing us. 
Uh, and so that could also sort of be, you know, fair game, sort of, you know, what, what, what do we think best case scenario this spring is going to look like? What might the fall look like? Um, and what kind of information do we have or not have that can sort of lead us to say anything with confidence about the spring and about the fall? So I sort of um, lay out those topics as, as possible touchstones in, in the conversation. Uh, but no doubt, um, you all will be coming with particular questions of your own. Uh, and it may be the case um, that you all have a question you want to le lead with, or we could just get started with a live question. Vicki, I see you're first in. And so why don't you just lead us off and let's see where the next hour takes us. Um, okay, so I have a couple comments and a, and a question in there for the discussion. Um, so I've heard a lot of feedback about the hybrid plan and how parents aren't thrilled with it because it doesn't offer a lot of hours for students to actually be in school. And it's because it's in the afternoon. Um, me personally, I like it because I'm not planning on sending my kids back to school until I'm vaccinated. However, I can see how for a lot of parents, um, it's not an ideal plan, but in my situation, it um, maintains distance learning, which is really important to me. Um, the second comment is that we have phase one active right now, and we have students on campus in small group cohorts. Um, and I understand that there are not a lot of um, volunteers per se, but we have our labor negotiations and we have some teachers who may be willing to go back to school and others who are not. So my question for discussion is why don't we almost like once a week or every other day, literally call up eight, 10 students, find a volunteer, open a new class. I mean, if every school at every location slowly started to expand phase one, hire an IA, uh, do a special ed group, um, hire a learns you know, person who's volunteering. If we did it one at a time, we could slowly expand it over time that we might have a few hundred kids in school right now that would be there five days a week, which would be meeting the needs of the families who wanna go back, but not disrupting the distance learners. And also answer this question that the hybrid, for me, four hours of risk isn't worth it. Um, you know, and is it really providing a lot of academic support for students? So that's what I'm throwing out there. Uh, that's a lot to throw out there. Uh, <laughs> thank you for leading us off. So um, wh why don't I, I'll talk a little bit and, and both uh, for uh, Ty and Laura, I'll sort of welcome you at, at, at any point that you'd like to sort of join in the discussion as well. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about the hybrid, uh, the, this model um, that we put forward. For folks who haven't had a chance to look at it, um, what we have proposed as a starting point to the Berkeley Federation of Teachers is, um, I'm just going to call it for shorthand, an AMPM model. Um, essentially, it sort of maintains the, the, the distance learning morning intact uh, while adding an afternoon component of in-person instruction. Uh, and then uh, adding the after school program such that a student who could come onto campus would receive two hours of instruction from their teacher and be able to stay uh, and on campus, uh, potentially as late as 5.30 or six o'clock at night if, the if families decided they wanted them to be part of that program. Um, so, so it's really the two components, both the time with the teacher and the time in the after afternoon program that we've been proposing as the in-person component of our hybrid learning model. Um, the model has a lot of liabilities to it, and I'm the first to say it. Um, and they try to take into account um, the sort of right now, at this very moment, what we understand to be the competing or differing needs of our families. Uh, we do have, according to our last survey, flawed or not, um, uh, some number of families who are just going to decide to stay home, um, either be until the rates get lower or because there are some things going on in their family that are just going to prevent their per uh, participation in person learning for, for a while. Um, we don't have an extra bench of teachers, uh, and so everything we propose to do is on our current staffing. Um, for every time that we ask a teacher to do an hour of one thing, we must ask them to take away an hour of another. Um, and it is, with respect to the workday, a zero-sum game. Everything has to add up to seven hours per day. So this particular balance um, is really sort of suited to what we understand to be the conditions in our community, the desires in the community now. And the reason that it's um, not, I've heard many families sort of ask, well, why don't you just follow the science? The science says it's safe to open, just open. 
Um, and and the reason, one of the reasons is that the state compels as a matter of law this year that school districts offer a meaningful distance learning opportunity to families throughout the course of the school year. Uh, and so we must account for those needs and the law at least this year, um, which means that sort of everything we're doing is at half strength um, in order to sort of account for these needs. Um, the other thing that's really sort of driving us towards distance learning is the social distancing obligation. Um, and we'll talk probably more about social distancing as it relates to the fall um, sometime later. Uh, but this sort of, can, you know, this requirement that all kids be six feet apart in the classroom around the hallways um, leads to smaller class size or the need for smaller classes and forces us into this split between being online and coming in person. Um, you know, the model will change, um, and I think it could change, you know, if community desire begins to change. Um, and I think it will over the course of the spring as vaccinations become more ubiquitous. Um, I imagine more and more families want to come back. Um, we've got lots of flexibility in our starting point to modify as we go through. Uh, but my emphasis is getting back. You know, I want to get something open so that we can build from there. Claudia, I see you're unmuted. Why don't, why don't you jump in, please? And then yeah. We'll, we'll Shamika. Um, one of the reasons that I have really felt it's important to get back to school is because as a mother, I had this inkling that this isolation and being at home alone is not good for your children. Um, I just want to tell folks on here, I work, I have a job, I run a company with 12 employees, or well, including myself. So every day I have to choose between my priority, which is my children, and my job, which is getting paychecks to 11 people every two weeks. I do not want to lay anybody off during this pandemic. And I make that choice and I, I often choose my children, but it's super hard. And they're alone. I have a 12 year old. He logs in every day to Willard. I want to shout out to Mr. Mac and Ms. Paraiso who are just killing it at Willard. And, but my son, I'm at work. He's often on like YouTube or Minecraft watching like 12 pranks that went too far. And I hope that's all he's watching, you know, um, let's hope. Uh, and while he's, while he's video to his class, and so I'm not there. And those are the choices I'm making. And I know he's better off in class. And so then when I look at the hybrid model that's been proposed, I'm like, how is two hours a week with these teachers, because this is who he needs to be with, going to help with the isolation and the mental health crisis, right? And I, I just want to point out, like, right now at Kaiser Oakland, they're dealing with as many people in emergency, as many kids in emergency who are having mental health breakdowns, teenagers thinking about suicide, um, sleep disorders, as they are COVID patients. They have as many patients in there for mental, for like, mental breakdowns right now. And so we have to think about what these risks are. And so then I think about how is this four hours a week going to help the children who are anxious and isolated? Um, and that makes me question the hybrid model. And then I can, you know, I'm here to speak about other parents today. I can tell you at least nine, I know I don't talk to that many parents that I'm, you know, stuck at my, we're all not socializing, but who said they don't want to return to school because that one to three schedule for those of us who work, which is why I brought up working, how would we get our kids, our elementary kids to school at 1 p.m.? Like, I'm gonna hire a babysitter to walk them to school, you know? And then, so I just wanna say, when we think about the hybrid model, like, I don't know what I'm going on here, but all of the other schools that I know, whether that's Nevada City, whether that's Marin, whether that's Rhode Island, if they're in hybrid, they're doing eight to three, two days a week, or they're doing 12 to three, 12 to, I mean, eight to three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. So this really seems like an anomaly, like another kind of odd thing that's happening here in our beloved, in our city that we love. Yeah, I appreciate the, the comments. You know, we spend a, a ton of time looking at other school districts models. Um, and so I've looked at a lot in Marin. Um, often find that when we go and look that they're, they're somewhat less than like they're portrayed in the media. Um, for example, just this last week, there was a newspaper article about Rockland opening up for five days. Um, went and looked at what's going on in Rockland, just outside of um, Sacramento. Um, and it was five days, but it was, um, you know, it was two hours. You either chose from eight to 10 or you got one to three, um, which may be an improvement over our model. Um, at least it's five days. Um, so, you know, where I've been coming from on this hybrid model is that we've got to start somewhere. 
um, and that by starting with maintaining this morning intact, we're both serving the, I think, roughly 50% of our families who at least at the outset would choose not to come in uh, and that we can move from that position um, as we go along, as we progress through this pandemic, both lower the transmission rates, which I think leads, leads to better comfort among families, but also get our educators vaccinated. Um, and as we sort of get to that goal that shifts become possible. Um, so we're continuing to sort of stay at it with the union. You know, we've been um, many hours per week now bargaining, um, trying to figure out sort of how to balance um, this zero sum game of teachers work day with all of these different needs. Um, and while we're also reviewing a bunch of different models and then just staying open to the prospect of sort of diff different um, models coming up as part of our conversation. Dr. Stevens, can I just interject for one second? Yeah, yeah please do, John. Um, uh, just a couple things. And um, one is just a bookmark, and maybe you can come back to this. This is a pretty elementary school focused discussion and, and the parents represented here. Um, so I do want to acknowledge our, our secondary middle school and high school families that are you know, really wondering, you know, what about our kids? What about um, the social isolation of the older kids? Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about why we're sequencing this and focusing on elementary school. Most districts are doing that, but, um, but that can feel to our parents of secondary students like, like we're not thinking about their, their needs and it's a crisis as much for them as it is um, for our younger kids. I, did, I don't think, did we get to Vicki's second question about phase one? I don't think we did. No, I did um, jot it down and, and maybe we should return yeah, to it. I just wanna validate that. And, and if you, I don't know if you have more to say about it, Dr. Stevens, but um, for those of you who don't know, the phase one is what we're currently in, which is um, having, having students in our schools. We're one of, I, th I think except for Piedmont, we're the only district in Alameda County that has kids in our public schools. Um, it's not many, but it's, it's, it's cohorts at three different schools um, on a volunteer basis, both the, the kids and the, um, the staff who are supervising them, doing their distance learning from, from our school sites, and then doing um, some outdoor um, playtime and, and other stuff as well. Um, I think Vicki's right, and I think that we're, we're moving with, the, with both, with our, both our teachers union and our union of classified employees. Um, towards um, agreements that will enable us on a volunteer basis to expand those programs in exactly the way that you said, Vicki, because once we, once we can get more kids on campus, that especially the, the families that want to send their kids to campus and get more teachers and staff on campus um, who, who, are, or who want to be there and are willing to be there, um, one, it's, it's better for those kids. And, and two, um, we can continue to, to see and demonstrate that we have the safety, um, health and safety procedures in place that make it a safe place to send your kid and to make it a safe place to go to work because we're a workplace as well. So um, I, I'm really hopeful that soon we'll be able to expand those programs um, uh, for the, exactly the reason that you suggested, Vicki. Uh, what if we uh, jump over to Shamik and then would it be okay, maybe we could jump over to a live question as well and invite a few people in here. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I wanted to echo Vicky and, and Claudia's concerns about the hybrid model that's on the table, um, but from a slightly different angle, I mean, Claudia was talking about the mental health crisis that's unfolding. Uh, I'm also concerned and equally concerned about the education crisis. Uh, we saw in last week's board meeting, some really concerning data about the learning losses in, um, in the district. In particular, I think the math was particularly striking in grades three to eight, there were dramatic decreases in, uh, in learning. And um, this was actually, there was a report which was released on Monday by an organization, Policy Analysis for California Education. They're finding the same patterns all across the state from the surveyed so numerous districts around California. And there are just significant learning losses, uh, particularly in math, um, in grades four to nine. Um, and particularly, most significantly, these learning losses are experienced by students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, so, you know, distance learning does work for some students, I think, and, and, and that's really great. I hear some stories from people I know about how, how it's, it's going pretty well. But I think it's uh, acknowledged that it doesn't work well in general. And, works least well, I think, for those, unfortunately, who need it uh, the most. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's not an exaggeration to call this an education crisis, given the sort of well-documented 
uh, effects that learning losses have on sort of lifetime earnings, on health outcomes over a lifetime, uh, and so on, and other quality of life indicators. But so with that in mind, with sort of seeing the problem from that angle, it seems like four hours per week is just not going to, to solve the problem, you know. And so I wanted to just put on the table a, um, uh, you know, a possible way forward, which I believe has been discussed, but hasn't been, um, you know, widely advertised in some of the, the surveys that have been sent around, namely of giving families who, for whom distance learning really isn't working, the option of full-time uh, in-person learning, while of course giving other families the option uh, or students the option of remaining full-time and distance uh, learning. And given the sort of survey results that, uh, that have been published, uh, you know, that you did in the fall, it looks like the numbers may well work out that, you know, 50% of the of students might want to return to class, 50% might want to, to stay back and the numbers would then um, allow appropriate distancing uh, within the classes. Um, and so I would, I guess my question is whether that, why that is not sort of more in the mix and the conversation as a possible way forward, given that that would really uh, do a lot to solve the, um, the education and the mental health crises that are unfolding. Yeah, um, so, so that model has been in the mix and actually continues to be in the mix, although I might just sort of offer one sort of quick correction, I guess. Um, uh, I don't, I, even with that model, the sort of way you're conceiving of it, Shamik, I think the very best we could do would be two to three days per week um, of in-person instruction, uh, maybe two and a half. Um, sure, there sure. is right now sort of no way the math works out to a full-time five-day-per-week um, educational experience. Um, and the reason for that is that um, even if we were to, let's say, reshuffle every class in the district, you know, create sort of a, an, a remote district and an in-person district, we still then have to implement social distancing. Um, and so that in-person cohort must be divided in half, um, thereby reducing the experience again. Um, it is potentially still more instructional time uh, than the model that we're conceiving of. Um, and we've been, th again, we've been thinking of this model as both the afternoon and the after school program, um, really trying to grow the pie by including an after school experience to the in person learning. Um, that would be far more social, far more recreational than academic. Um, but it's sort of in response to feedback that many parents would appreciate that in addition to bolstered learning. Um, so again, we're sort of midway through conversations about scheduling um, with our teachers union. Um, we have yet to sort of arrive on a firm model um, and we continue to toss around even concepts um, while we make progress towards sort of, you know, detailed scheduling issues. Uh, and then we're also, you know, having pretty detailed conversations about reopening criteria um, as well as what Ty just described, as well as, you know, expanded phase one volunteer opportunities for teachers. The other thing I, I think that I would just mention again, I know I've noted it several times, is that um, we have been thinking about um, needing to um, move through, not have a single point in time decision about the model, um, but sort of design flexibly over the course of this semester. Things continue to change so rapidly, and I think particularly with the advent of vaccines, um, it really could be a game changer in terms of the kinds of models that become possible. And it's particularly around student cohorting and, into, and teachers' interactions with cohorts, um, where we begin to think far more flexibly about what's possible. And we might not get there for several months, um, but designing now so that we can morph several months from now um, is part of what we're trying to work through. And so I guess if I were to sort of put a summary on that is that you know, even as we make a decision, um, we should all be expecting that there could be further changes to the model as we proceed through this pandemic and kind of work through what I hope is this last phase of the school reopening work um, and sort of getting back to what I hope will be full-time instruction in the fall. Maybe can we go give Hollis an opportunity? Um, yes, please, thanks. Yeah, thank you. There's been a lot of comments um, and I fully well understand that it's, it's tough for a lot of people. Um, but you know, being around a lot of educators, it takes a lot to prepare what you need to do for your classroom and asking teachers to basically create and double their day by having an in-class learning session and doing virtual training and doing all the visits they do at home to drop off supplies and, and books to parents who aren't able to get online. It's kind of untenable. 
Um, so I understand there's a great need and believe me, I want my kids back in school as much as anyone too. And I understand the issues of social, social isolation, child my treatment and different things that are happening in the home. And, um, but it's just how to do it, right? If there's no more money coming down to hire additional IAs or to hire additional staff, then how do we propose people do their job, double their job with no time, right? So I'm on the PTA at my board and at my school and been on PTA for a number of years. And I go to the Berkeley um, um, PTA uh, meetings. And the one thing that I think is most interesting is that everyone wants to have their kids back in school, right? No one doesn't want to come back. But I think the question is how to do it safely and sanely. And for me, the most important thing is to not berate the federation or berate the district about opening, but it's about how and how can the PTA help facilitate that discussion. Like, you know, if there are needs that need to be met or if there's items that are on the, the list of that people want, then can the PTAs help fill that need? You know, my school pays for a lot of different services or our PTA pays a lot of services for the school. Are there funding issues? Is there staffing? Can we create volunteer opportunities for parents? Um, so it's not just to bang on the door saying you want something, but the question is how do we do it? How can we help? Can I talk to that, Steve, um, Brent, and Hollis? That's great comments. What I hear a lot from parents is that there's no there's no path forward and there's no certainty because we were given the set of guidelines that we needed to follow from the county to reopen. And um, these were our county public health officials. I feel lucky that we live in a county where people in our county are very smart and very well educated. You know, so we're given these set of guidelines. But now we're being told these medical experts, the person who was in charge of Alameda County and, and you know, the city, that we're not going to follow their guidelines, that what we're hearing, what we hear directly from the district is that the Berkeley Federation of Teachers wants us to follow other guidelines. And so how can we work with that? You know, I mean, you know, if we're trying to, to move something forward with multiple set of rules, I, I don't understand that. And, and then one thing I just really want to say to people here is that, you know, in our community, like when you need a hip replacement, when you have cancer, when you have a stroke, we go to UCSF and we go to Kaiser to those doctors for treatment and for them to tell us how we're going to get better. And now the doctors at Kaiser and the doctors at UCSF are telling us to, op to put our kids, if you can, back in school and under what guidelines and just to be direct, it's apparent that we're not following them. If we were, our schools would be opening next week. So how do we one address that? Push, one thing I push, Claudia, is that we trust our teachers with the most important things that we have in our lives, our children. Mm -hmm. So if they're giving you a recommendation about what they need to be successful and safe, I think we need to take a little bit of heed in that. And I hear a lot of people talk about what the doctors are saying. I want to hear what that public health official, the epidemiologists say about disease transmission, about how to prevent it. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing that my child is alive, right? So for me, when there's a, a credible and useful and widely available vaccine available, that's why I want my kids to go back. My wife is a nurse, my mother works in the health field as well. They've got, one's gotten their second dose of the vaccine, right? She deals with COVID patients all the time. My wife is on the track to get her second dose. Um, I want one too. Right? I don't want to send my kids to a place where I don't know if they're going to come back healthy. Right? That's the most important thing. And one thing I'd offer to you, Claudia, as well, you know, when this whole pandemic started, like you, I didn't know what to do with my kindergartner and my fifth grader or my fourth grader. What am I going to do? What I did was reach out to some of our community members, some people in our classrooms and say, hey, you know what, can we create a pod? Can we all make some arrangements about what we do with our families and how we're going to get through this together? And luckily, I'm fortunate to have space in my home and we've had some other people who have space in their homes and we do a pod system, right? So we, we tapped on our community resources and came together as a TO family and TO parents to say, how can we make this work? It's not the same for everybody and everyone's not gonna have that opportunity, but I, we chose to reach out to people who aren't necessarily super close to us, but say we have common interests, we have common needs, let's try to work this together. And it's been working for us um, for the past six months. Um, so if that's any way at all possible, reach out to your PTA, try to make those contacts and see if there are other parents you can connect with in your community to kind of help with the, with the um, watching of your child when you're, when you're working. I, I, I want to address that first thing because it's really important. So 
when we talk about, you know, doctors who are a specialist in the science of how disease spreads, these are the people, this is who our county public health advisors are. This is who the CDC is. And you're absolutely right. There's no one I would trust more with reading, with social emotional development than my teacher. And in fact, I'll take my teacher's advice from my children and their counsel. And I have, I also have a child with an IEP. A teacher told me, my first grade teacher told me that my daughter needed one. And I said, no, no, she doesn't. And they had to tell me that she did and they're right. And she wouldn't want me talking about it now. But I wouldn't just, and when my doctor might say, oh, everything is, is fine with your daughter's reading and learning. But when, but I also wouldn't go to my, doc, to my, uh, my school teacher for a treatment of how virus transmits. And I just want to talk about the data, like more children have died eight times more in California from the flu than from COVID. And do we mandate the flu shot in school? We don't. And do you have put a risk of putting your child who has asthma into the school of catching the flu? I mean, three years ago, we had a devastating flu epidemic and the whole school went around like nothing was happening. So it, it, we do need to listen to the experts in their field. I mean, I, and th that's really important to me. And, and that might be a major divide between us um, and between some people, but you know, I think that we have to, to listen to public health experts when it comes to what are our safe opening guidelines. Claudia, I, I have a minute. question. Can yeah, I just ask then, Claudia a quick question? Oh, um, I'm going to go to a live question. Okay. Um, so what I'm confused about is, I mean, the district wants the school to reopen. The district is trying to reopen schools. Teachers want the schools to reopen. These professional scientists and doctors are saying it's safe to reopen, but they're not saying it's safe to reopen for all students all the time, five days a week. They're saying it, they have to be six feet apart. It has to be only 50% of the students mm -hmm. in class. They have to wear masks. Yeah. So what the teachers are doing right now and what the district is doing is negotiating what that looks like. If you have a solution of what that looks like that will meet the needs of families and teachers, then you need to bring that forth. Not what frustrates me is families say, listen to the science, open the schools. Well, yeah, but how? How are we going to do that? What does that hybrid program look? How do we meet the needs of the families who can't get to the classroom because buses can only um, take 10 kids instead of 70 kids? How do we meet the needs of the kids who have asthma who aren't going to be in the classroom? You're just saying open the schools, listen to the scientists, but you're not saying this is the way we move forward. And that's what frustrates me. Let me, um, so first, uh, just on behalf of the district, um, to state very clearly, um, we want to follow the recommendations of local health officers in thinking about when to reopen our schools. Um, we also need to follow the law in creating agreements with our labor unions about how to open our, that we, we're not absolved from that responsibility. Um, but I do want to be really clear um, through this entire process that we're committed to reopening. Um, and for all the reasons we talked about, we want that option for families who need it, for students who need it, while also protecting the option for families who won't be able to take advantage of it. And therein sort of lies to the sort of work at hand. Um, I'm gonna propose that we take a couple live questions because um, we've got a, a whole stack of hands here. Um, Can I say something quickly on, on this as point? As long as it's quick, Shadik. <laughs> Well, I think Vicky's exactly right that when the question is sort of how to reopen, um, that's a tricky, very tricky issue that we've been discussing about hybrid models that, that, that you know, the teachers and the teacher unions and, and BUSD have to have to figure out. But when the question is about when to reopen, I think this is when uh, we should really be listening to the public health officials that we listened to in March. So, you know, back in March, they said, look, there's this really scary virus coming you need to shelter in place, we need to close the schools, and we listened. And one thing that's really great about this place is that you know, it's other places in the country, some people didn't want to listen, but around here we listened. What they're doing, now, they're saying now that they've learned so much over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, they've collected a huge amount of data, a huge amount of information, which is telling them um, that when it comes to the question of when, we can open much sooner uh, than we thought. As, as Dr. Stevens was saying, we can open when the case rate comes to 25. Um, and I think the concern that is being expressed by Claudia is what it, with that question of when to open, surely we should be listening to these public health authorities who have spent their life studying this kind of stuff, um, just like we did back in March. 
Uh, we we agree completely with that perspective. Um, Jessica, can you take us over? We've got a, a set of folks who've been waiting patiently. Um, would you be willing to to unmute somebody, and we'll we'll take one of our live participants? Maddie. Uh, Maddie, you should be able to speak now. Uh, good evening. Yeah, yeah. It's and uh, by the way, it's pronounced Mati. Mati. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, first, I want to appreciate the, your uh, buying into the straight stock um, um, conversation. I think uh, it's long overdue, and we're welcoming it now. Um, <clears throat> And language does matter. So a couple of pointers about language. Uh, when you say that there's speculations in the public about what happens in the uh, negotiations with the uh, teachers union, it's because we don't have information. And it's because, and I'm sorry, Dr. Stevens, I think this is on you. Um, you're the one who's been communicating with us it's becoming a little bit more open, more transparent recently, but we've had months of veil, of words like uh, uh, labor partners and on and on and on. And um, just recently in your last email, a couple of days ago, you talk about productive uh, negotiations. Well, if they are productive, why are you showing the same set of slides about the differences between the district and the unions to board meetings in a row over a month. That's not productive or something is being hidden from us. I don't wanna get stuck on this thing, but we need more transparency about what's going on in the negotiations. Because at the end of the day, you all are negotiation, ne negotiating on our behalf. And I believe at this point, we need to know. That's point number one. Point number two is about setting goals. You know, when, uh, when the US went to the moon, it wasn't NASA director that says, oh, let's go to the moon. It was the top executive who said, by the end of this century, we will go to the moon. I'm equating this to the board of, dire of, uh, of directors, setting a goal, then the administrators, the bureaucracy makes it happen. And we haven't heard the board, the board of directors setting clear goals to you to act upon. We just heard today something uh, or a couple of days ago from uh, Director Babbitt, and I salute her for her honesty and openness, but we haven't heard it across the board from the board saying, we want you to open, we want you to do it ASAP. You know, the only time that the conversation got heated about reopening, it was about whether or not we're missing the train in some budget, uh, additional budget that the state allows. Point number three. Point number three is that uh, let's recognize that uh, BUSD teachers right now are, are providing 40% of their regular contractual instruction time or uh, employment time. Um, four days a week, three hours, that's about 40% of what our, our students receive uh, regularly. So when you're saying zero sum game, well, there's about 60% of the game that's hidden somewhere in the agreement that the, the district have made with the teachers early in the pandemic. And I recognize that at the beginning, it took time to, to ramp up, to build up the distance learning, to get used to the, the platform technology, et cetera. But as we all know, once you get used to it, it's, it's, it works. It streamlines and makes your, work, your life more efficient. And also there's no commuting, et cetera. So, we're talking about uh, volunteers and need more staff. Well, there is stuff, our teacher staff. We need to adjust this, the, 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 the timelines is scheduled both for distance learning and then it will allow for more time also for the hybrid system of in-person. I want to allow other people to speak, but I think these things have to be said openly, clearly. And this community has been too long receiving too little information to have trust. So when you say that the, the district has a goal of opening, we need to see it. It has to be seen. Words no, no longer can only words suffice here. And I think it has to come from the, from the, from the board of directors, from the president of the board, um, um, 
uh, Ty Alper to say, this is what's going to happen and remove the, the, the clouds and the obscurity of all this process and what's going on in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, why don't, if, if it's okay, I'd like to just sort of talk a little bit about negotiations and, and how, how they work. Um, and, I, and I think it's a very fair question. So, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, um, the, the sort of framework of laws that are both federal and state that sort of dictate the obligations of employers to employee unions um, have not changed. Um, they remain intact. There's no exceptions. Uh, so anytime that um, an employer proposes to change an element of the workday for any worker, um, there is a state law obliging the employer and the employee's union to engage in what's called effects-based bargaining. Uh, you got to bargain the effect of the change to the workday. Um, distance learning and hybrid learning are about as large a change to the workday as anybody could possibly imagine. It's every minute of the workday has been rearranged. Um, so imagine sort of every, you know, seven hours and 10 minutes of duties needs to be discussed for employee class after employee class after employee class for four unions. Uh, so it's absolutely monstrous. Um, in this particular case, um, you know, with, with uh, where we are now, um, we're obliged, you know, some states are different. I'll, I'll say that first, there's, there's right to work states. Um, and those are the 17 of them in the, in the United States. Um, and so you, you find a far sort of weaker or degraded union system. Um, we've also seen a number of states adopt a very different policies with respect to school opening. Florida, for example, famously back in July said, if you don't reopen, we're not paying you. Um, that was not California's policy stance. Um, here in California, um, it is the expectation made explicit, um, even in the governor's statement just last month, that every single community is going to go through collective bargaining. Um, and there's been no sort of state level relief. So when you bargain, there's a couple of, um, I just call them electric rails that you just do not want to touch or you can get really bad outcomes. One of those electric rails um, is failing to make progress um, and either side in, the, in, in that sort of process can declare impasse, um, that is an option. Um, if impasse is declared, then you get into a set of months long, uh, mandatory sort of interventions that include fact finding panels, they include investigations. If we lock up an impasse here in Berkeley, we will not open. Um, it's just very simple. Uh, we'll be obliged to go through about six months of essentially sort of bureaucratic intervention um, that will just finish off our school year. Um, on the other side, you know, attempting to sort of implement, um, force the situation, you know, bust a power move um, and say, we're just gonna do it, um, could result in labor action, um, could result in requests for injunction. Um, could result in wildcat strikes like the one that was so well covered in Chicago just last week where half the teachers didn't show up. Um, we now see that UTLA, UTLA the, the um, uh, union down in LA is threatening to strike. So in between these two really bad outcomes, these sort of third rails, which continue to be in effect, um, is this narrow aperture through which the district and the unions have to, have to travel. Um, and that is the sort of negotiated agreement. Um, and we get there through partnership. Um, we get there through listening to one another. We get there not by badgering each other, um, but by really listening intently to the genuinely expressed needs of our labor partners uh, and what we bring to the table, which is to say, our kids need to get back in school. Let's continue to stay at it. So, so I, you know, that's probably sharing a little bit more about sort of why this is taking the time it does and the sort of risks involved in collective bargaining. Um, but, but I hope in that answer, you sort of get a sense of some of the, the, the unintended negative consequences of approaching this cavalierly um, or not really working in earnest with our partners to come up with something that is respectful of the teacher's workday doable um, while providing the maximum benefit to our students. And, that, and that's, the travel, that's the path that every single district in California must travel or has traveled in order to get open. Can I add, add to that, Dr. Stevens? Yeah, please do. Um, uh, Mati, thanks for those comments. I, I, I had a couple of responses. One, um, I mean, I would, I wish that you had said, you know, can the school board president just tell us what's going to happen? I wish I could do that. Um, obviously, I can't. And 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 for the reasons that Dr. Stephen just explained, it's it's um, we're, we're operating. We're let me put it this way. Um, We have we we all have um, 
we all have shared goals. You know, one, one of the things that this the pandemic, you know, has done is um, I think it's distracted us from who the enemy is. The enemy is the pandemic. It's, it's not each other, um, but it's created these divisions, these divisions t between teachers and, and parents, divisions between parents who want to keep their kids home or feel like they need to keep their kids home and parents who desperately want their kids to be in school. Um, educators who need the vaccine in, or feel like they need the vaccine in order to come back to school and other vulnerable, maybe more vulnerable members of our community who, who need the vaccine. Um, it's not the divisions that the pandemic has created, I think are inevitable. I don't know if they're anybody's fault, um, but they're really um, upsetting and distressing. And I think we're, we are all concerned, we're, are, are threatened to cause long-term damage unless we sort of all commit to coming together when we're on the other side of this and remembering our, our shared values and our shared commitment that I know we all have to all of our children, um, to equity. Um, that's like not specific, but it's something that it's very much on our minds. The, the question was, has the board um, you know, taken a position? We have, we, we unanimously gave direction to, to our staff um, to, do everything within their power to be able to open schools when allowed to by public health officials. Um, our teachers believe in science. I, 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 the, the teachers that I talk to on a regular basis believe in science. They, um, the, the union, the teachers union has, um, has a, it, we're negotiating as Dr. Stephen said, we're negotiating right now. We're at the table, we can't open right now, we're in the purple, but we're negotiating um, as our other public districts in the region, we're all kind of in the same boat. BFT's position, the teachers union position is not an outlier. Um, uh, we were negotiating with them. They, the, the, the teachers believe in science. They also know their kids. They also know, we're talking about secondary, they know Berkeley High. They know how crowded the C building hallways are in passing period, even with half the, the students at Berkeley High there. Um, the, the science that says, masks and social distancing is as good as, as, as a vaccine, which I think is what the science says. And, and mm -hmm. that's what I learned certainly at the, the panel that the, the USD parents put on. Um, well, the social distancing is a key component of that. And it's a real barrier to a full reopening of our schools. Um, the, the regular mask wearing is something that some teachers have seen in their own experiences that is, is not always followed. Now, a lot on the other hand, there's a lot of studies that have been done, a lot of anecdotal experience that actually kids can learn to keep their masks on. Mm -hmm. And um, lots of adults that we know do go to work in, in closed buildings. Our, our, the second floor of the district building has, has dozens of employees you know, every day, masked and distanced. Um, but our, our, our teachers aren't ignoring science. We're negotiating with them. We've taken the position that a lot of parents have, have advocated for us to take, which is that we should open when public health allows. Um, and I think Vicki really hit the nail on the head, honestly, but it's how to do that. Um, and there's a lot of details. It's not easy. Um, and, um, and I just, and the last thing I'll say, I know I'm rambling a little bit. Um, it's not the case that our teachers are only working 40% time right now. That's just not the case. No, um, they, uh, they are, yeah. I, I teach over Zoom now at the law school one day a week for two hours and it's like the hardest thing I've ever done and and and, and it takes so much work so much more work than it ever used to. and I'm teaching adults you know basically sort of lecture they just sit there to, to the, the our teachers who have to teach all day or or even half a day and then find you know reach out to the kids who are who are having trouble or can't get on the technology and and how to um adjust your curriculum at that age over zoom it's just um so so much harder of a job, they want to get back to, to regular teaching. They, they truly do. Um, and, and, and I just hope that we remember that, um, that we all have that same goal and, um, and we're going to get there. And the vaccine has a lot of promise, um, but it's, it, I, I just hope we don't demonize each other because I don't think that's going to be productive. So I want to comment on that. I, I don't think the parents are angry at the teachers and I don't think like Vicki and I are planning to put 
choose different choices for our children, but I, I'm not upset with her at all. And in fact, she's not upset with me. We know that we're both gonna be supported in this district. And so it's not about being divisive. What it's about, what my question is, if we have this, I wanna ask the district and hear a clear answer, I think the parents do too, with the set of county guidelines around safety protocol, have, has that been met? Has the state guidelines been met? If tomorrow we were under 25 cases per 100,000, has the, school, has the district met the guidelines for public safety under COVID in opening schools? Yes, we're, we're there now, Claudia. You know, we couldn't open in a day. We have to train our staff. We have to get ready. But, but yes, all of the sort of facilities prep and the testing, everything that's required of us is now ready. And then I know Laura is dying to get in this too. I, I can see you leaning in. And so I want to want to pull you in as well. Laura, give me Thank like, give me two minutes, Laura, um, or one minute. Just, I just want to say, I, I hear what you're saying, Claudia, um, but in, but Shamik, you, you asked before about um, why we can't split the district into two, you know, and have everybody wants to go, go, and everybody wants to stay, stay. Um, and Dr. Stevens answered with respect to um, social distancing and why even, even the families that wanted to send their kids to school, they could only go half the time because of social distancing requirements. But he mentioned something that I don't think, that can't get lost, which is that if we did that, we would have to reshuffle all the classes. And that means that the families who stay home, who have many of whom, for, for, for whom distance learning actually is working, or they bond, the little kids have bonded with their teacher, um, to reshuffle all the classes two thirds of the way through the school and say, You've decided to stay home in distance learning, which is absolutely your right. But because we're redoing how we're in doing elementary school this year, you're going to lose your teacher and you can get a brand new teacher for the rest of the year. That may be something that we decide to do. I mean, it may be that we decide as a district and as a board that's looking out for all kids that that on balance is the right thing to do. But it's unavoidable that it's pitting those two constituencies against each other. It just is, and and it's an, and it's one of the things that I think is unavoidable. But it is pitting those two interests against each other. No, I, I understand that. I, I guess I, I would like to just urge that it's this is a that we're in the crisis period. We're, we're facing a um, a COVID crisis. We're facing a mental health crisis. We're facing an education crisis. It's really important not to let the great be the enemy of the good. I think here. I mean, that's abs you're absolutely right that 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 that, that proposal would entail um, certain non-ideal outcomes that um, some students might have to change change their teachers midway through the year. I think in the big picture, when we're looking at the data about the enormous learning loss, the enormous increase in mental health crises that's going on at the moment, this is that would be a matter of letting the great be in it, the enemy of the good. To, to I, I would have to beg to differ because there's so much that's learned and gained when teachers make that um, connection with children. So to say in the middle of a school year, you're gonna have a brand new teacher who you don't know and it probably wouldn't be a teacher, it would be a, a volunteer in I while you're doing school over Zoom in a classroom. That's, that's kind of how it's set up. So logistically, it doesn't really work that way, right? Children don't bond with someone in a matter of minutes and then you have that trust. I hear your concerns. It's very much, and I understand and I get it. The one thing I want to, I want to say to people, because I know we're getting close to time, is that there's so much interest that's on this call right now. We're saying there are 500 people here. Um, I want to call people up to get involved, right? I want everyone to join your PTAs, to go to the um, ELAC meetings, to go to different meetings to get involved. Everyone here has a stake in this, right? I've been to so many PTA meetings where there's five or 10 or the same six people in all the PTA meetings trying to make meaningful decisions, right? There's so much interest here. I wanna see some of you and I hope and urge you to contact your PTA officers and ask how you can help and what you can do to offer and proffer to make the situation better for everyone, right? I'm hearing a lot of what I want, what I need. I also wanna hear what I can do to help out from everyone here. Let me um, do two things if I can. So I'd like to um, first just note the time and I, can we, can we go a little bit longer? Has everybody got it in them? Okay. Uh, and then um, let me go to Laura, please. Uh, thank you so much uh, and thank you all for this discussion and for all of your comments and for really sharing your heart and I'd just like to share mine as well. Uh, we need to be our brother's keeper. We need to think about what is happening outside of our own homes and what our most uh, 
our students who need, what do our students need the most? Not just my own child, not just works for me. I am my brother's keeper. And when we find that our kids are suicidal, we need to be our brother's keeper. When we find our kids are having nervous breakdowns, we need to become our brother's keeper. And that is why I sent that letter. And that is why I'm urging our union, our district leaders to really step it up. I was just as surprised and alarmed as most of you were on uh, January 20th when I saw that data, when I saw um, our, our union partners still talking about opening in the orange. We don't have that kind of, that kind of time. And I don't wanna be like Las Vegas when we reopen because kids killed themselves. This is literally what we are dealing with. You may be able to create a, create a pod and that's awesome. A pod is not going to work for some families who have elders in their home. It is just as much risk as that cohort at the classroom. So if I'm more, more. At risk in my home, then it's gonna be because she's with an educator and she's learning. She's with that, that that's gonna be her pod, right? Uh, we are in the business of educating our youth. We are in the business of providing for their social emotional needs. And we have got to do our jobs. We Andrew. have all got to step it up. We have all got to put somebody else above ourselves. Because this moment is detrimental. And we do not know how we are going to come out of it. We don't have a plan for their emotional recovery. Five months from now, ten, we do not have an 18 month recovery plan yet. There are districts who are already in that phase of the 18 month recovery plan. We've got work to do. We need to get negotiations behind us. We need to follow the science. We need to get our kids back in distance learning and we need to have a solid schedule because this talk about we can always change it later no, we need to start with a program because to just change it later is going to create a lot of logistical nightmares for many principals, for many administrators, for many families. So we have got to set what we are going to do and reach that goal, just like one of the callers said. We don't have time to wait here. We don't have time to keep talking about this. We have to be the leaders as school board directors we have to be the leaders for these changing times. As district leaders, we need you to be the leaders for these changing times. As parent leaders, we need you to be there for these changing times. And flexibility has got to take a part in this conversation. And again, I'm just gonna end with be your brother's keeper in this moment. Thank you. And, and I agree with you, Director Babbitt, wholeheartedly. You know, I'm, I'm a social worker at heart and by training. And I will say everyone is here to get their needs met. And we want to come with a strengths-based approach. Um, I fundamentally believe that every primary educator of their child is that parent, right? I want to make sure that these parents are making sure that they're looking out for their children. They are spotting the signs, right? We train all of our teachers to look out for this. We need to train ourselves as well. You are your primary child care provider and your, pro and your primary educator for your child. Each parent in here, right? It's not the responsibility of the state to take care of your child, it's your responsibility. So it's all these parents, look out for your children, ask what they're doing, be involved in their lives. Don't put them in front of that TV and just say, okay, you're done for the day. You have to be active in their lives and ask questions and be curious. Let them tell you that 15th story about that Minecraft thing they did because that's important as well. So I don't wanna put it out there. It's not just the educator's responsibility, it's the parent's responsibility to maintain the safety and well-being of your child. I, I, ha I have to respond to that, okay? Because I have a job and just like the teachers have a job and I can't sit there with my kids while their, their class ends at 1145. I'm sorry, Hollis, I can't. I have 11 people to pay that I can't lay off. And there's 500 people plus watching this. And I'm just gonna be honest. I have never been a worse mother than I have been in the last couple of weeks. I have done things that I am ashamed of because I am so stressed from the work, from my kids' mental health. And when my kids are hiding in their room, you know what they need? They need to go to school. 
because school is a refuge. For those of us whose parents got divorced and were angry when we were kids, school was a refuge. When your older sibling is, is belittling you and angry, school is a refuge. You know, when your parents is, is crying because they don't have money for food this week, school is a refuge. And we've taken that away. And you're gonna say that during this crisis that we need to put more on parents when we have been everything for our kids for 10 months. Like, you know, for me and the other moms out there, I just can't, I can't say I'm doing my best and it's not good enough. I need help. I mean, I, if I could just jump in, I mean, I think Hollis is right that we, it is my responsibility to be a father to my children. But I think by the same token, I think we should all acknowledge that it is BUSD's responsibility to provide public education for the children in this city. Uh, we, they, the, the, as I said earlier, you know, the people who have spent their lives studying infectious diseases are now telling us uh, that it is safe to open up. Now, there's good questions about the how, but the, with the when to open up, they're telling us it is gonna be safe to open up very shortly in Alameda County. Uh, and given everything that's at stake, given the, the education crisis, the mental health crisis, there's so much at stake. We can't, we can't pretend to try and make this up by ourselves. You know, we, we are not epidemiologists. We've got to listen to the experts. And so, yes, I will take on my responsibility to be the best father I have, but we must, as a school district, uh, accept that responsibility to provide in-person education as soon as the public health experts say that we can. I think any delay, I think any delay beyond that is, is irresponsible and not taking on the responsibility that the district has to provide that in-person education. While we have a few extra minutes, I wanted to change gear to address many concerns in the question and answer forum from parents of older children, particularly when we talk about mental health crisis, it's our middle and high schoolers that are in this situation. And um, many of the parents have asked, what does hybrid look like in those situations? Do we think that those kids are going to go back to school at all? Or can we look forward as um, uh, Director Babbitt had mentioned this 18 month plan, what is our plan? Plan for the fall. If we still have to be in um, distance, um, like social distancing in the fall, how do we do high school? How do we do middle school? Are those things being discussed for those children? Um, so if, if we can maybe address the planning that's taken place for our older 50% uh, of our students um, to end on, that would be great. Uh, well done, facilitator Vicky. Thank you for, for that move. Um, and I think that, that that seems like the right place to end um, this evening's discussion. Uh, we have spent a lot of time about elementary schools. Let's talk um, about middle and high school specifically. Um, it, it's true that this is the, the single most challenging sort of aspect of our school reopening. Um, and there's a number of things that make it really hard, both at Berkeley High School, which is far and away the single biggest challenge that the district will have, but at our, at our middle schools. Um, that has to do with, you know, what we call the master schedule, but kids going to see six teachers, uh, moving from group to group. Um, and it has to do overall with um, uh, also that, that teachers teach very particular things. You know, you're a math teacher, you're an English teacher, you don't teach all the subjects. So it creates both staffing challenges for our staff of underlying health risks and will not be able to come back in, um, as is their legal right. Um, and then it creates these logistical challenges of groups moving to and fro through the halls, through the hallways. Uh, my, you know, so the, the hybrid model for um, middle school and high school is much like our starting place discussion for elementary school, and that is to keep distance learning intact for the morning. Um, simply because it will be with the, with staffing and social distancing nearly an impossibility to do otherwise. Um, and then um, to take advantage of our educators in the afternoon uh, during their workday um, to begin to introduce a whole set of possible activities um, that could include academic enrichment or remediation, um, that could include enrichment activities, sports clubs, uh, the electives um, that folks are missing, and then all of the club opportunities that are part of the middle and high school experience. That's sort of where I see us going at the, the middle and high school level. And I'd, I'd rather speak about that candidly um, than to sort of offer a vision in the short term that we will be returning to the hallways to go class from class from class. I do not see that that's sort of in the short term prospects. Long term, looking ahead at the fall, Vicki, you're sort of naming the key element 
um, that really drives what the fall will look like. And that is health officers' insistence that we maintain social distancing. Um, I do think that we will see a version of school in which masks are ubiquitous, probably for the better part of 2021-22. Um, I think we'll be seeing COVID testing um, for all of next academic year. Um, but the social distancing, this is where my hope now, given months of vaccinations by, by August, um, given that all of our educators will be vaccinated if they choose to be, um, if we can set aside the social distancing, um, that's where I sort of see us returning to a five day a week model um, for all of our kids, elementary, middle and high school. Um, not quite normal, but, but still far, far better. And if I were to sort of articulate what I think is the path ahead, it's going to be sort of a series of small movements forward over the next couple of months um, that include, as Vicki mentioned, expanded cohorts, um, that include the sort of move into hybrid, um, not letting great be the enemy of good, um, that include um, uh, sort of accepting the positive effects of vaccination for educators that's going to take a little while, um, but that that really loosen, begins to loosen the dialogue. Uh, and that it eventually includes in the spring planning for what is going to be a five day per week return to school uh, in August with all of the sort of safety conventions likely minus social distancing. Now, again, I don't get to make that decision. That'll be county health officers. Uh, but if I had to sort of guess, and this is not you know, me being optimistic or fantastical, like I think this is the path we're going to travel, um, that we will get open this year, um, that it's not gonna satisfy all needs in the short term, uh, but that we will see movement in increments um, towards more and more education in person for, for our students. Um, and that that will happen this year. Um, I'm absolutely convinced of it. So with that, um, I think it's time for us to say our good evening. So um, on behalf of the district, um, I first wanna thank our parent panelists, um, Claudia and Vicki and Hollis and Shamik. Thank you so much for joining us, um, for asking the tough questions. Um, Laura and Ty, thank you very much um, for also taking the night out um, to represent your perspectives as our school board directors. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for your help behind the scenes. Um, and then to our literally hundreds of people who have been tuned in now for two hours um, for part one and part two of this dialogue, I'm just very appreciative um, I hope that this has felt uh, um, helpful, um, sort of satisfying, minimally just to hear a whole variety of perspectives vented, um, put out there with passion and earnestness. Uh, but I also hope that there's been sort of information about what's actually going on, um, feels like a candid conversation. And if it um, turns out that it helps to put more time on the clock, um, just set up another one of these so we can stay in dialogue, um, then all of us I know remain open to that. Um, again, we're a community. Um, we derive our strength from community. We were great before the pandemic because of our community spirit. Um, we're great now and we're gonna be great again uh, as we get towards reopening our schools. So with that, um, my thanks um, to all of you and I wish you all a very good evening. We'll see you all very soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Talk to Stevens. <laughs>